Today's talk is a beginning of a new book. The book is The Places That Scare You by Pema Chodron. And today I will go over the prologue and the first three chapters. To begin with, the proper way to listen to a talk like this, or any Dharma talk, is to keep an open mind, to avoid rejecting things, to contemplate, chew on what you are hearing, and then have the intention to be open, flexible, and kind. It's easier said than done, but if we don't try, it won't happen. One of her main teachers was a Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, and he said, live your life as an experiment. So make aspirations as you are hearing this or any teachings to learn and try new things, to become a better person. And at the end then, as a gesture of universal friendship, dedicate the merit. These teachings uh, and their benefit are to be shared. So on page two, she says, I offer this guide on the training of the compassionate warrior. So that's what this is. This is a guide to how we can train to become more compassionate. And the idea of a warrior is not going out and uh, attacking and making war and conquering enemies. It is a compassionate warrior will experience fear, but because of their bravery, go beyond the fear to not be cowered or cowered by the fear that can arise. So any activity that you do that benefits other beings or benefits you in terms of a truly beneficial way, dedicate the merit of that activity. Even if it was a failure, just by trying, by being motivated properly, you've created a lot of merit. And she says that we need to learn from our failures rather than you get, uh, what would I say, overwhelmed by our failures. So. One of my favorite quotes is by Thomas Edison. And it is, I haven't failed. I just found 10,000 different ways not to make a light bulb. So if we live our life as an experiment, then we will find there are lots of different ways to not accomplish what we are trying to accomplish. But that's not a problem because actually when we look at that, we will find that we're in very good company because the rest of humanity is having the same experience that they are not accomplishing what they really want to accomplish. And as a result, they're suffering a lot too. And if they're not a compassionate warrior, it can be a huge, huge problem. So the first chapter is titled, The Excellence of Bodhicitta. And it begins with a quote from The Little Prince. Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche liked that book and he talked about it a lot. There's a lot of, um, well, you can learn a lot from that book. That was why he liked it. And he encouraged his students to read that book too. It's a short book. A lot of people might think it's a child's book, 
but it's really not a children's book. It is written from the perspective of what a, ch a child would find interesting, but it has a lot of very profound uh, insights in it. So uh, to go on, when we get into this chapter, Pema Chodron says this, that we always have this choice. And here's her quote. We can let the circumstances of our lives harden us so that we become increasingly resentful and afraid, or we can let them soften us and make us kinder and more open to what scares us. And this is what bodhicitta is all about. And it is made of two Sanskrit words. The first one is bodhi, which means awake or enlightened or completely open. Chitta means mind, heart, or attitude. So you could say to put these together in a different slightly different meanings. It's an awake mind. Uh, it is an awake heart. It is a, a enlightened mind. It's a completely open attitude. She equates the, that uh, this heart and this mind of bodhicitta is a soft spot a place that is, quote, as vulnerable and tender as an open wound. And this is kind of the scary part because we don't want to have open, vulnerable parts uh, and wounds. So compassion is part of this. It's being able to feel the pain we share with other people. This is actually part of being human, is realizing our own pain and then realizing that we are all experiencing pain of one sort or another, and it's usually very similar to our own pain. And this gives us a connection to other people, a relationship, an understanding. So usually we have protective walls with our emotions to keep us from feeling vulnerable. Vulnerable feelings are love, gratitude, loneliness, embarrassment, and inadequacy. It's good to let them touch our soft spot. It's important. Not only is it good, it's important. Again, this helps us connect with other people. It helps us understand that their pain is very similar to my pain. And this is the beginning of this bodhicitta, this awakened mind. We can always go there. But it's very difficult to go there because it's clouded, clouded over by our fear, our negative emotions, and so forth. But since it is always there and it can't go anywhere, we can learn to access it. We do not have to get it from some other place or another person. It is always there if we just learn how to access it. So there are two types of bodhicitta that are talked about in Buddhism. The first is unconditional bodhicitta. And this is the immediate experience, free of concept, opinion, and our usual, as she says, caught upness.
There's no judgments here either. It's just being open to what is happening right now without adding anything to it. You might say it's just plain unaltered pure experience and awareness. Relative bodhicitta is, quote, our ability to keep our hearts and minds open to suffering without shutting down. <clears throat> so, as I said, the, the uh, bodhisattva warrior is not uh, free from fear, but experiences fear and does not go give in to it, but goes beyond the fear that maintains an open heart, this soft spot, that wants to alleviate the suffering that he or she sees in other people. A bodhisattva warrior is not afraid of challenging situations. And when I mean by challenging situations, difficult situations, situations that may be totally new, where you don't really know what you're getting into, but you're not afraid of going there. This is this idea of a bodhisattva being an awake being. They're not afraid to work in a positive way with their own personal reactivity, with their own personal self-deception and their faults of all kinds. We have all kinds of faults and actually the more we see the better off we are, because if we don't see them, we can't work with them. This bodhisattva warrior wants to learn new ways of being, wants to change, wants to transform into a better person, to become who they actually are. And then we train in awakening our courage and our love, because love is an incredibly important part of it being this bodhisattva warrior. And so since we're talking about training, the training includes practices of a meditation, a loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. All of these we need to train in and develop. And on page six, she says this, warrior will never, excuse me, warrior accepts, we will never know what will happen next. Uncertainty is always present. Impermanence is always present. Things are constantly changing. And just because it's a similar situation to one that we were in in the past, it doesn't mean it's the same situation. It will always be different. Warriors are more of a verb than a noun. And we'll see the situation more fluid and more like a verb than a noun. And of course, people within the situation, other people, they are the same way. So the question is, she says, how do we relate to discomfort? Can we go beyond fear? And of course, 
bodhicitta can transform any activity as a means for awakening our compassion. And so an example that is right here, right now in front of us is COVID-19. There are lots of opportunities for us to awaken our compassion. When you start seeing things uh, on the news, reading things uh, online about what's happening, how, how people are dying, how people are afraid, how people are losing their jobs, are in very tough economic places and are stressed out and having all kinds of other problems. This is an opportunity for us to go beyond our fear and start feeling their pain and start understanding their pain. And I think you will find too that the situation you are in is a lot uh, better than the situation of a lot of people. For one thing, you haven't died. And a lot of people around the world have died. This gives us a chance to connect with the world. So the second chapter is tapping into the spring. And so she talks about the soft spot again. She says it can feel edgy and uncertain. And this is not a problem. That if we can be with that, that's actually an act of kindness to ourselves. It connects us with compassion to ourselves. And it's very important to be able to do this. This accommodates our own fears. Courage is necessary for this to happen. The metaphor that Chogyam Trumpa would use is the cocoon. And that is that the, um, and I prefer to use the uh, metaphor of crystallis. So we can look at the caterpillar who spins a cocoon around itself, making it out of its own bodily substances. And then inside that cocoon, it goes through a transformation, a metamorphosis. And at some point, if it's going to fly and turn into a butterfly, it has to get out of the cocoon. It has to get out of this very claustrophobic uh, container that it built for itself. And so the idea is that we are bodhisattvas in training. And we want to stay in the cocoon, even though we could fly if we left it. It feels safe, secure, and so forth in our own tiny little self-created cocoon where uh, not a whole lot of new things happen and beyond it, it can be quite scary. And in fact, you could say that the cocoon that we build around ourselves, the very edge of that is fear. Whenever you run into fear, you've run into the edge of your cocoon. But it's our destiny to fly. And we have to realize that even though the familiar is familiar, it's still painful familiar. And that by leaving this painful familiar to go to the unknown is actually going to reduce our fear and suffering. So it's ego that imprisons us in this cocoon. 
that it is our ego that makes us feel that we are solid, permanent, unchanging, and so forth. Where in actuality, if we look at ourselves, we are actually fluid. We are in a process. We are interdependent with our environment and with other people in the environment. We are not independent. If we were independent, we wouldn't have to worry about catching COVID-19 because we're independent from all of this. But obviously we're not. And we are not independent from the economic situation that is developing. And so we are probably all affected one way or another by the economics, whether it be uh, our uh, shopping habits, uh, not be able to go to stores that we would like to, uh, or whatever. Uh, it could be job insecurity. It could be losing your job. It could be all kinds of things that are happening that are a result of this COVID-19 pandemic. Things changed pretty quickly. So running from uncertainty weakens us. We might think we're avoiding things and it's better in the long run, but it actually weakens us. Shakespeare says, a coward dies a thousand times before his death, but the valiant taste of death but once. So that is cowardice. And to quote Pema Chodron, finding the courage to go to the places that scare us cannot happen without compassionate inquiry into the workings of ego. So we need to get to know ego. We have to make friends with our fear. To see how it operates in our minds and in our behavior. One of my favorite analogies is a scene from The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy and her friends are coming to the, see the wizard because they all want something from him. Uh, Dorothy wants to get back to Kansas. The cowardly lion wants courage and so forth. And so they enter through this castle big door and it's a big stone castle. And in one corner of the uh, room that they walk into, which is a huge room, there are flames shooting up from the floor. And uh, there is the sound of thunder. And there is this big booming voice that says, I am the wizard. And everybody is shaking and afraid, except for Toto, the dog, who runs over to this curtain and pulls the curtain back. And there behind the curtain is this gray-haired old man speaking into a microphone. And he has two levers, one in each hand that he is operating. And uh, Dorothy sees him. He sees Dorothy. He turns to the microphone and says, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. The point being is to make friends with our fear, we have to make friends and pay attention to the person behind the curtain that's pulling our levers, pushing our buttons, causing us to give in to the fear. It's no other than our ego. 
So it takes gentleness and honesty to do this, but not brute force. We need to be like a nourishing mother to ourselves, encouraging us to grow and change, to go beyond our fear. Don't be the mother that is on the dock with her child trying to teach her to swim. So she pushes the reluctant child in the water. That is not the approach that you need to take with yourself. Gradually, little by little. And it's the Lama's job to encourage you to go further than you would by yourself. So I want to encourage you to go further than you would by yourself. You can do it. So going within and seeing how uh, ego operates in our lives, how the fear operates in our lives, you have to look. If you look, you might see something. And so gradually you will see your ego strategies, your beliefs, your habits. You'll start to see cracks in the wall and then light coming through the cracks and then a way either through the cracks or around the wall. Here's some advice I like. Is the quote is, when you come to a wall, throw your backpack over it first because then you have to find a way to get to your backpack. So don't give up. Next, she talks about three strategies that we use to gain the illusion of security. And they are called the three lords of materialism. So these are methods that we use to escape anxiety, boredom, depression, loneliness. There are other things that we will try to escape using one or all of these uh, methods. The first one is called the Lord of Form. And this is how we look for externals to give us solid ground, to escape from the reality of groundlessness. The idea of groundlessness is that things are constantly changing and that there's nothing that is, you might say, eternal. So the question is, what do you do when you experience anxiety, boredom, loneliness, depression, insecurity? So she has a list here, shopping, alcohol, food, drugs, sex, adventure, nature, books, the phone, texting, surfing the net, TV. And this is the short list. I think we can all think of many more things that we do, uh, even if it's only a little bit every once in a while, to escape. Uh, the thing is that these do not lead to lasting satisfaction or security. It's just more of the same old, same old. And because of diminishing returns, the more you do, the more you have to do to receive the same amount of, uh, what would I say, release uh, from whatever it is that you're trying to escape from. The solution is instead of running away and becoming uh, diverted in various trivial activities, is pay attention to what's going on without judging it. Acknowledging whatever is going on, look deeply, have this soft spot for yourself. And uh, humor is really important. It's good to laugh at yourself when you kind of unmask that person behind the curtain. The second is the Lord of Speech. 
And uh, she describes it this way, how we use beliefs of all kind to give us the illusion of certainty about the nature of reality. So there are all kinds of isms, uh, political isms, ecological isms, philosophical isms, spiritual isms. And this Lord manifests as having a rigid, narrow mind. Again, it's really easy to see this in other people, but we're not talking about other people here. We're talking about how do you react when your beliefs or your views are contradicted by somebody else. So on page 13, she says this, the problem isn't with the beliefs themselves, but how we use them to get ground under our feet, how we use them to feel right and to make someone else wrong, how we use them to avoid the uneasiness of not knowing what is going on. When we have put up these walls, this cocoon, they keep us from experiencing what's actually going on. It's just more of the same old, same old going on and we keep saying the same things. So a way to see if this is a problem for you is, uh, are you getting worked up? And if you're getting worked up, this is a sign that you have this problem, the Lord of speech. The third is the Lord of mind. And this is attempting to avoid uneasiness, that vulnerability, that soft spot, by seeking special states of mind, altered states that can be achieved through drugs, alcohol, sports, falling in love, and even spiritual practice, having exotic experiences, uh, experiencing bliss when you are meditating, and so forth. All of these things, it's, you're just solidifying them. It's fine when you meditate, and you're meditating properly to experience bliss, to have moments of clarity and so forth. But you have to let go of these and you can't start a meditation session thinking, I am going to have a fantastic experience this time. Or if you do have some unusual experiences meditating, then keep thinking about them and talking to other people about them when you're done meditating. Uh, that we can't solidify our experiences. If we do, it's an obstacle. We can't recreate it. It has to be fresh. And these special states tend to be addictive. Uh, that uh, it not only holds back your progress, but you can go backwards if you start attaching to these things. There's a story about Gampopa and Milarepa. Gampopa was Milarepa's student, and Gampopa was an exceptional student. And so as he is practicing the practices that Milarepa told him, he would have some very wonderful experiences. And so he would leave his meditation cave and go talk to Milarepa and uh, Milarepa, and he would tell Milarepa, Milarepa would say, oh, okay, well, go back to your cave and keep practicing. That uh, Milarepa refused to, you might say, take the bait and say, oh, that's fantastic, that's great. Because as soon as uh, he would say that to Gampopa, Gampopa would shut down and he would not progress in his practice anymore. That the idea is that even if your meditation is going very, very well, uh, you have to let go and keep practicing. So, 
these three lords of materialism are uh, ego strategies that pervade samsara. It's good to see them in ourselves. There's no point in seeing them in other people. And we have to see them if we're going to connect with uh, bodhicitta, this soft spot in our heart. And that soft spot in our heart is ordinary and it's always available. So the proper way to work with faults when we see them is being gentle, uh, perhaps having a little bit of humor, uh, having wisdom and realizing this, and this doesn't mean you are a terrible person, but that, that you need some work to do. And this is, you might say, adventitious stains on our ultimate Buddha nature, which is faultless. The last chapter uh, of the book that I'm going to cover today is The Facts of Life, chapter three. So she begins this chapter with a uh, quote by Zigar Kontro Rinpoche, who is her present guru. Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche died in 1987. So this is the quote, if we stop observing change, then we stop seeing everything as new. So in this chapter, she talks about the three barks of existence, impermanence, egolessness, and suffering. So if we look at impermanence, we will see that um, our own experience is constantly changing. Uh, that our bodies change, our minds go all over the place. If, when you sit and meditate, you will find that your mind is going all over the place. That our moods go up and down. Our emotions go up and down. How long does your mind stay still? Can you control your thoughts or your emotions? Look at these things yourself. Don't just accept what I'm saying or what other people have said. Uh, if you accept what others say as the truth, then it's their truth. If you investigate and see for yourself, it becomes your truth, and that's much more important. So uh, in terms of impermanence, um, Maintenance, we're constantly having to do maintenance, whether it be to our car, to our houses, to our clothes. I'm going to do laundry a little later today. Uh, washing the dishes, cleaning the house. All of this needs to be done. We buy insurance because things might break. Uh, they might burn up. They might... Uh, uh, have a storm and get destroyed. We might get in an auto accident and so on down the line. That uh, we think that we are safe. We've got the enough insurance, but of course insurance doesn't put things back to the way it was. If you have life insurance, when you die, you don't get a new life. And people that have had, uh, um, if you have health insurance, Again, that will just help you get health care. It won't cure you. That uh, when it comes right down to it, doctors don't save lives, they prolong life. Uh, we've got this COVID pandemic that just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Uh, and it has really brought home impermanence uh, in all kinds of different ways, whether it be health, uh, how much the government can actually protect you, uh, how uh, fragile the economy is, and so on down the line. 
she quotes uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, and this is, I think, a great quote. That's why I'm quoting it here. We are always in transition. If you can relax with that, you will have no problem. This is this idea of we are verbs and not nouns. We are not solid. This transition is always happening. So egolessness gets into this more. Uh, when we suffer to impermanence, it is not because we couldn't get it right. This is the way the universe operates. And nobody has been able to avoid uncertainty, no matter how powerful or wealthy you are. And finally, uh, she says, we experience impermanence at an everyday level as frustration. And I think we can all relate to being frustrated when things just don't go the way we would like them to be. So the second mark of existence is egolessness. Ego is having a fixed idea about ourselves as being solid, unchanging, and independent or separate. So we take ourselves so seriously, we feel justified. Can you laugh at yourself in an open-hearted way? not in a mean way. How often do you see your beliefs as beliefs and your assumptions as assumptions? Or are they truths? Well, we have to make assumptions. However, we have to realize that this is a, a working base. Uh, an operational self is what we need to have. That if we look at things, plans are just well thought out fantasies. Here is a quote on page 20. In the most ordinary terms, egolessness is a flexible identity. It manifests as inquisitiveness as adaptability, as humor, as playfulness. All of this gives a space to move in. This brings you out of that uh, crystallis. It gives you room to change, to be flexible, uh, for newness to enter and for limitless possibilities to enter. So with this understanding of egolessness, we aren't trapped in a identity of our own making or one that other people made for us that we have assumed. And it's the same for other people. Uh, others aren't who we think they are. So egolessness is freedom and joyful. When you actually experience egolessness in, for the first time, this is called the first bhumi or bodhisattva level. And it is titled The Joyful One because it's such a joyful experience to experience for the first time egolessness and being out of that crystallis. The third mark of existence is suffering or dissatisfaction. Pain is unavoidable. Suffering is optional. You're not a failure when you experience difficulties, obstacles, pain, even death. This is the human condition. 
accepting that suffering of these types are unavoidable and inevitable brings relief. We can quit beating ourselves up as a failure. And uh, instead of feeling a failure, we develop a certain happiness and strength from realizing that this is just the way the world operates. So to finish things up here, she has three tragic misunderstandings that we have of life. Number one is, quote, we expect that what is always changing should be graspable and predictable. So impermanence makes that impossible. That what actually we have is fluidity and space for things to move around and change. Two is we proceed as if we were separate from everything else, as if it were a fixed identity. When our true situation is egolessness. So even seeing oneself as worthy or unworthy gives you the security of living in a prison. That uh, we are, as I said, more of a verb, a work in uh, progress or a work in process because we're necessarily progressing all the time, uh, but we are constantly a process. Finally, she says, we're looking for happiness in all the wrong places, that we mistake what causes suffering for happiness. Karma explains this, that we engage in behavior that reduces temporarily uneasiness, boredom, insecurity, worry, and so forth. Uh, and uh, what happens is it actually weakens us. It builds stronger walls. And because of karma, it leads to more suffering in the future. So on page 22, she says, because we mistake what always results in suffering for what will bring us happiness, we remain stuck in the rep uh, repetitious habit of escalating our dissatisfaction. This is called samsara, and it can end. That we can actually relax with life as it actually is. And again, samsara is a Sanskrit term. It's used widely in Buddhism, but it means cyclic existence. It's this life that we live in from birth to death, and then we will be reborn and again experience samsara from birth to death and then die and be reborn and go on and on and on. It's cyclical. So this uh, completes uh, my talk on the first three chapters of The Places That Scare You.